They mad, they high. They get in the bad, just better than having some heart. Okay, look now, look now, look how they run it. They beating white people down just to show us what's coming. Or to show us we nothing. Or to show us we only welcome when singing or balling. You shut up and dribble. Fire. Uh, high, rock. Love. Hey everybody, I'm Carrie Champion. Welcome to We The People. So today we are having a very candid conversation with athletes and artists who want to make sure that you use your voice to vote. Voting is your voice. So we have so many different issues that have happened in this country. It's really truly unprecedented time. So I'm looking forward to these conversations. I think you'll be educated as well as entertained, but most importantly informed. We have morethanavote.org, whenweallvote.org, and fairfight.com. Those resources are imperative as we try to change our future. Yeah, la la. There's no way that we can talk about hip hop or even the fact that we wanna talk about activism, black voter suppression without bringing in this guy straight from Port Arthur, Texas. We are talking about Bumby. He is an activist, a scholar, and an all around gentleman. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Bun, I don't wanna start heavy, but I guess I have to because that's where we are in the world today. It's heavy as hell. And when you think about what needs to happen in this country in terms of change, what's the first thing that you think of? Um, Equality. That's pretty much the first thing that, that comes to mind, right? Black people need to be seen as equals in this world. You know, we had to fight just to be recognized as a full citizen in this country and not um, three fifths. The world is now seeing what we've known for so long in the culture and in the community. Um, the one way that we can fight is obviously voting. Talk to me about what voting means to you. I hear people all the time talking about one vote doesn't matter and that voting doesn't make a difference. If that's true, why do they work so hard to suppress the black vote? Because they understand the power of the vote. And so it's time that black people collectively also understand the power of their vote. And not just on a national level, because a lot of times we only have this conversation every four years. People need to be very much involved in their local politics. They need to understand who their elected officials are, where they stand on issues that affect you. And you need to use your vote to either support the ones that um, care about you and your condition or to elect people who do. A newer initiative that we're dealing with is um, educating felons, right? So in the state of Texas, um, if you're a felon, right? If, if you've been to, to jail or to prison, and but you're no longer on probation or parole, you have the right to register to vote. Um, another thing um, that was just brought to my attention, there's an initiative called the Orange, which is happening not just in Houston, but all over the country. If you're in jail mm -hmm. currently um, during pretrial, but you have not been um, convicted, like you, you, you're still in jail waiting to, to for your day in court, you are still eligible to vote. And you said something so key. They work so hard to hope that we stay uninformed, but more importantly, to suppress the black vote. If you could do one thing with this message that we're trying to send today about how important voting is, what type of images would you like our people to understand and see when they go to these polls and vote or when they cast their ballots? I think the images that we've all seen, you know what I'm saying, for decades in this country, if not centuries in this country, we've seen black people oppressed, we've seen black people attacked. So every time you look back and you see those old black and white images of people of color being attacked by dogs and people of color being sprayed with hoses, that's what they were fighting for. Back then they were just fighting yeah. for a chance to vote. People like Martin Luther King Jr., people like Malcolm X, um, these people died to help us um, be in a position to have the power that we have now, which is to be able to cast a vote and make a decision about the people that have controls over our lives. So, I mean, if, if you if you in your own community need a reason mm -hmm. to vote, look at a person like George Floyd. If the people in your city are not open to police reform, are not open to having the conversation about defunding the police, are not open to issues concerning economic equality, judicial equality and racial equality, right? If they're scared to say Black Lives Matter, you have the power to put people in those positions who do believe that Black Lives Matter, who do believe in racial equality, economic equality, judicial equality, That's right? right? That's right. Who see us as human beings. And if the people in your in your community don't feel that way, vote them out. It's that simple. It's just vote them out. We, we don't have enough time to sit around and hope that people change their minds. Yeah, Bumby, you point out something so important. We have the power. 
And that is in our vote and that is with our voice. And that's how we use our voice. I, I think of where we are right now and people say this is a particular moment, but it is a movement, not just a moment, it is a movement. Uh, why, in your opinion, was it George Floyd's death? Why was that the chosen um, brutality for people to say, oh my God, black people are still oppressed in this country and it is not fair. I think it's twofold, Carrie, and so many different encounters with between people of color and the police, there simply is no proof of what happened in the interaction. Mm. And so what happens is in a court of law, um, it tends to lean towards the policeman's point of view, right? In this case, we saw very clearly what happened. I think the other thing is, is due to the fact that everyone was at home, basically um, during this time period in relation to the coronavirus, you couldn't avoid it, right? It was on every television station. It was on every social media platform. Everywhere you turn, you were constantly hit upside the head with this message. You see in the interaction that this man did nothing to deserve what, what happened. That's right. That, that, that's so well said, because if you think about it, in the, gra the grand scheme of things, it wasn't worth it. And he didn't have to lose his life. I think that we you brought on, you touched on something that a lot of people talk about, um, and that is now defunding the police. That has been such a huge conversation, but there's so many misconceptions around defunding and dismantling. Uh, if you will, educate the audience. All right, so most people, when they hear the term defund the police, they tend to think of, oh, they're gonna take away our police department. Nothing could be further from, from the point. Defunding the police means that in certain communities, even in Houston, take for example, we had over a billion dollars allocated to our police force. Now, what is that money being used for? Some of that money tends to be allocated towards riot shields, right? Pepper spray, right? That kind of thing. That's only used against the people that fund this, this budget, right? So why would the people want to supply the police with the means to oppress them? If the police are concerned about the situations in certain communities um, with a higher crime rate, well, higher crime rates tend to happen in communities where there's not, um, there's, there's not uh, employment opportunities, right? There's not a lot of social services and people are going to do what they need to do to take care of themselves sure. and their families. When the community has more opportunities for employment, more opportunities for upward mobility, then they tend to be a less of a strain on the government. They tend to have a lower crime rate. And because of that, we'll have less need for the police in those communities. You um, are passionate about so many different things in terms of making sure that we are holding our leaders accountable. Talk to me about some of the other projects that you're working on. Well, right now, obviously being a part of more than a vote is essential. Um, we're dealing with primaries in this country right now. And we just want to educate people. We want to inform people because people are tired, they're angry, they're concerned and they want information and they want action. And so we wanna make sure that we give them the right information and lead them in the right direction. And we thank the people that do not look like us for standing with us right now, because it's very mm -hmm. important that people that people who aren't black be involved because if black people could have gotten rid of racism, we would have done it hundreds of years ago. And so I'm trying to use my voice and my platform just to let people know that if they feel like I do, there's a number of places they can go to enact change in their community. People need to know about how their city council runs. They need to know that they have the ability to speak when city council meets, to let them know that that's not the way that they feel their city needs to be run. Those are not the places that they feel the money and, of their community Bob, needs to be allocated. And Bubby, even a step further, they can run for office in their local community. They can run for positions. Like people act like they leave it up to somebody else. If you're upset, I, it's not hard to get on the school board. It's not hard to be a part of the city council. It really isn't. And depending on how small your town is, you could be a mayor. It's the power is with the people. And we need to just know that that's happening. Absolutely. And it's always been with the people. You know, if you look at Trayvon Martin's mother, Sabrina Fulton, right? She felt that there was a system of racism and a system of oppression that led to her son's death. And so what did she do? She ran for city council and she was elected yeah. city council. Our own former president, 44, Barack Obama, right? Started in the community as an activist, ran for an elected position, became senator, ran for another elected position and became president of the mm -hmm. United States. So don't think mm -hmm. that you can't make a difference. You know what I'm saying? You don't need a lot of money. You don't need a lot of power. Your voice is enough to make a difference. Amen. I feel like I need to go out and run for something. You gave me a rousing speech there, sir. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this. Um, when I when I talk to um, my brothers, I have to ask you, as a black man, how are you doing? Are you okay? I'm good. I'm good. I have a very strong relationship with God, so prayer definitely works for me. I have children and grandchildren who are watching me, who are encouraged by what I do, and they're proud of me right now. You know, and that's really what matters. You know, the change starts at home. Mm -hmm. 
you know? So as long as you have a support system that believes in what you're doing and supports you in what you're doing, you have everything you need to go out there and fight the good fight. And for those that don't, there's a community of people here to help you. So you can go to places like morethanavote.org. There are many different places that will encourage you, inform you, and they will put you with groups of people that feel like you that are ready to take action. So no one has to go about this alone if they want to do it. Yeah, yeah. we're stronger together. People have been saying it, but that has much more meaning now that we are in our movement, not just this moment. Bumby, it has been an education, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Keep fighting the good fight. Keep up the good fight. Yeah, la la. So our next guest, I have to admit, I'm a fan, uh, but there are so many different people that we could talk to, and I thought it was so imperative that we speak with her. You know her as Molly uh, on the huge, successful show, Insecure, HBO's Insecure. She also has a comedy special highlighting her Nigerian roots, and she's an amazing podcaster. Let's welcome in Yvonne Orji, everyone. You have such a beautiful way of making things funny, giving us our medicine with some candy, right? <laughs> The humor yeah. and the healing, you bring all of that uh, to your space. And right now, as you look across this country and how everyone is so broken and so upset, if it's not social injustice, it's the pandemic, it's depression, it's unemployment, the list goes on and on. How are you doing, quite frankly? You know, I am, I'm rediscovering self in a way that I, that is hard, but necessary that will lead to ultimate joy. I know it sounds like like a lot, but no, I, I think I, I personally put think that God put all of us on a global timeout. Like we just, you know, America hasn't done as good as other people when it comes to timeouts so, because everyone else is out playing at recess and we look, we're still in the principal's office <laughs> hoping and wishing we can come out. But I think that if we settle into the timeout, and really learn the lesson that we're supposed to learn from this season, I think we'll emerge better. We'll, we'll learn how to play well with others in more ways than one. Uh, mm -hmm. And so personally for me, I'm taking this time to, to learn me in a new way. I feel like I'm being ushered into a new season and I'm getting still. Cause sometimes the busy uh, confounds the, the work that we're supposed to actually be doing. You know, we're busy doing other stuff, but we got work that we need to do on the inside. And I'm like, I'm leaning into it. I'm like, dang, I thought I thought I was going to be able to rest like everybody else. And you guys like, now nah, we got work. To do. You know what? And I think that's what everybody is saying about 2020. It's demanding that we be better. And you said it's a global timeout. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's like everyone sit down, sit down, be humble, to quote the great prophet Kendrick Lamar. Uh, but like, no, seriously, sit down and let's reevaluate some things. Let us unearth and shake up the things that we have been trying to hide within ourselves, within our nation. Um, I think America is going through an unraveling right now, a much needed, a much necessary one. And I think all eyes on us, right? There is no, oh, I was on the subway for an hour, so I didn't miss that thing that happened. No, everybody was home. Everybody, you know, was watching when George Floyd died. And everybody, no one could, could hide it. Everyone was watching when Amy Cooper called the cops. Like, this is a, a time where it's like, oh, we can't pretend it away. We can't excuse it away. No, 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 no. It's a global timeout. Sit down, watch, and let's learn. And globally, it's like, hey, we were going business as usual, but it ain't usual no more. Like, that, mm. that, that's old. Anytime change occurs, it's very uncomfortable. And so right now we're sitting with the, un we're, we're getting, <laughs> we're getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. The minorities, we've been comfortable with being uncomfortable because that, that to me explains just the existence for whatever we want to do, how we break into our careers, how we live our lives, how we find ourselves one of the few or one of the first. Um, and that's a lonely road. When you look at, and when you talk about this global timeout, everybody had to pay attention to Amy Cooper. Everyone had to pay attention to George Floyd. How was that? helping us as a people, as a country during our global timeout? I think, well, one, we're not minorities, Carrie, you already know it. It's like th these labels that they put on us. It's like, it's like, yeah. it's like the same way of saying like black on black violence. Also, there's no white on white violence. It's branding. Yeah. Right. right? <laughs> it's all branding. Yeah. You're right. You're it's right. like white people can white people every single day. So no, there is no black on black violence. 
And if you say black and black violence, well, then let's brand white on white violence. Like, I watch mm-hmm. Investigation Discovery. <laughs> Ain't too many of us. <laughs> these features. But to answer your question, what does that do? I think what everyone expected is what has happened in the past when the world was still open, right? In that, okay, you had everyone, uh, uh, from Trayvon Martin to Castillo to Sandra Bland, you had all of these, all of these lives lost. And black people made some noise. You know, we rioted, we, we got out in the streets, we started the Black Lives Matter movement, all of those things. And then after, and then white people kind of just like, oh, let's give them something. Or, and then it's just like, is it over? It's like, it's like Oscar's so black. Okay, okay, good. We got, we gave some Oscars. Are we good now? Like, are we even, mm-hmm. you know? And it's mm-hmm. now it's just like, oh, no, 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 no. This is not about, this is not about like a, a Band-Aid. It's like, yo, we might have to amputate the leg a little bit, but it's all right. Because we're going to, by amputating the leg, we're going to save the body. Yeah. And so I think that's what's happening now. Like. America is realizing like, oh, black people aren't just making a little bit of noise. Like the protests are still out. The the conversations are still being had. The change is still being demanded. And I think they're seeing, oh, this is not going away. And no, it's not because we need systematic change. What a beautiful way to explore what is happening and describe our country. We might have to amputate the leg, but that's to save the body. That's what's happening right now. That's beautiful, Yvonne. Um, And to that end, I have to ask you this, because the way that we do that, we use our voice. And our voice right now in this world, in this country, is our vote. Um, And everyone talks about voting and how important it is, but I feel like more than ever, we understand that it's not just about voting every four years for the man in office. It's about your local elections. It's about the mayor. It is about the district attorney, the people who have the power to bring charges against police if police brutality is an issue in your community. If you care about your school district, you can run for the school board. I ask this of you, right? Your parents are from Nigeria. You are Nigerian. You talk about that very lovingly. What does voting mean for you? You know, I think voting is power. I remember, you know, I was I became a naturalized citizen um, back in the 90s um, when, because um, I, I was still a minor, my mom naturalized, and so we were able to do it under her. And just even that power of, like, we are American citizens and all the access that we have by being citizens, one of those accesses and those access to power being voting, it's a big deal. It's a big deal because not only are we do we have the opportunity to be in this country, but now we can be of the country. We can be of the systems. We can be of the rules. We can be of um, what it actually affords. But I think going back to your earlier comment about uh, just the setup of systems, I think we are done a disservice either at schools or whatever it is, and I'm not putting teachers on blast. I think teachers do a phenomenal job, but for some reason, we do not, and, and give them all the raises. I, I know too many parents who are like, I might, this child of mine, I do love them, but hey, who, <laughs> <laughs> where can I drop them off? And I do think that there is a disservice done because again, when we talk about them, to your point, we talk about every four years. It's important to vote for the presidency. We don't realize like, oh snap, we actually can vote about like how much our libraries get. It's like small things like that, but they make a big difference. When you think of voter suppression in this country, what does it look like for you? It's interesting. When we talk about voter suppression, we also talk about systematic racism, right? It's all the systems that set up. And we've, we've normalized, okay, maybe your job will give you a half day, or maybe, you know, you'll be able to get this luxury. It shouldn't be a luxury, it should be built into the system, it should be built into the fabric of how we vote, but maybe you'll be able to get this luxury in order to enable you to go vote. Think about everything a disenfranchised, marginalized Black person has to endure in a day. So in a day, you need to get to work. If something happens to your car, if something happens to your child care, if something happens to... There's so many factors along the way that can send you into a tailspin as an American. And then you add on as a person of color. If you're just trying to get to know, and you already have to go through all of these hurdles and hurdles in your everyday life, imagine the one day when your voice, your voice really is supposed to matter the most in this country, but then you also see all the times that you try to have your voice matter, and then it's been shut down, repressed, told it doesn't matter. And then you're kind of like, what's the point? How do we keep, how do we keep hope though? 
if if I if I'm watching this right now, I wanna I how do we as a people stay hope how do we believe in the promise that these quote unquote forefathers have given us? Because have you met black people? Why, why, why? <laughs> Like hope is infused in our DNA. Like you know said, like, like if we haven't been if we haven't been broken now through be it through slavery, through give capitalism, it to, give it to me, give it to me, colonization, through segregation, yeah, right. through you know, I mean, listen, black the the history of black people in this country is at one point we were three fifths of people. Mm -hmm. That's it, that, that, that was a written law. And look at us now. We are whole. We are black girl magic. Yeah. We are black boy joy. We are, you know, mm -hmm. what I'm saying what I what I think about in terms of, of giving us hope, right? We're making a lot of people nervous right now, Carrie. We're oh, making girl. a lot of people Man. nervous right now because they're like, dang, we put all these obstacles in their way, and these jokers are resilient. But that should give us hope. That should give us hope that like we can't stop, won't stop. I mean, I went to the school of Diddy. You know what I'm saying? Hashtag bye 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 bye. Harlem shaking it right now. <laughs> Stop. And I and I, I think that's our motto. We can't stop voting and we won't stop voting. We can't stop marching and we won't stop marching. We can't stop thriving and we won't stop thriving. To that end, because you led me directly there, um, I've been asking everyone who has appeared on this platform, what does activism look like? And I feel like back in the day, we had an idea. Yes, it is marching. Yes, yeah. it is protesting. Yes, it is speaking out against things that we feel are not right or unjust. But talk to me about what activism looks like for Yvonne Orji. Listen, activism, I think the beauty of activism is that it has many faces, right? You, you're you going to have the people on the front lines. Like, you know what? Martin Luther King marched, but there were a lot of women who were in the homes like, hey, BT Dubs, when they come back, this is this is how we support all the people who are marching on the front lines. And we're going to be here doing what we know to do best here. And you know what? Somebody needs to bail them out of jail so that we need to, so now we need to be in the community, you know, getting money or whatever it is. So it's like everybody has a position to play. And so play your position like a shortstop, bro. So whoever you are and whatever you do, play your position. So activists could look like, you know what? I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not the one that's built to be on the front line, but you know what? My pockets go deep. So I'm gonna support the people on the front line. You know, I'm a comedian. Black joy is a form of activism. There's always a call for entertainers or celebrities that have the platform to do something. Why aren't you speaking out? I'm not a believer in thinking that it's mandatory. Like you said, everyone can be an activist and be activated in different ways. But talk to me about the connection. Uh, talk to me about the marginalization in your world and how you feel like it, it even inspires you to say more and use your platform to do more beneath the surface of what we do, like Nisi Nash says, it's the the who, right? The who is the person who's gonna be like, hey, let me call this, let me call this out. Either blind racism in terms of overt racism, in terms of ways that we can be better, in terms of ways that we can actually be more uplifting to the community that we don't even, you may not even realize that you're serving. Before I let you go, talk to me about the urgency in your opinion for people to vote, our people to get out and vote this coming election. Yeah, I mean, guys, 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 if you think, if you think you're tired now, I'm telling you right now, we cannot, we cannot take this sitting down. We can't take this jokingly. I understand that it may be hard to figure out who to vote for, but at the end of the day, we got to vote for our families. We got to vote for our legacies. We got to vote for continued progress. We have to vote for upward mobility. We have to we have to vote for equality in a way that is long lasting. And if we succeeded before, we can do it again. You talk about the whole. This is this is the time. This is this is not the time to to give up. This is not the time to pretend a way that we haven't made progress we have there's still much more to be done and you know what we might have to get to a point where we pass the baton to our children and our children's children but we still have work to do now for that generation 
Von Orgy, you are everything. You are Molly, but you are not Molly, but I love you so much as Molly on HBO's Insecure. <laughs> you are an amazing podcaster, Jesus and Joloff. Shout out to Lovey. Um, and then we also have movies. Like you, the world, you're a, a model, a cover model. Also, wait, don't let me forget your hugely successful uh, st uh, stand-up comedy um, special on HBO. Girl, you, I mean, you're doing it all. And I am so grateful. You are truly the dream, not just the American dream. You are the black girl, brown Brown girl, do it all dream, the immigrant immigrant dream, everything. You're a beautiful, beautiful soul. I really, really mean that from the bottom of my heart. Yvonne Orgy, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> nothing but the best and excellence personified. Thank you so much, my friend. I love you so much, mama. Mwah. Yeah, la la. So Atlanta has been one of the hotbeds in terms of political unrest and social injustice. We've seen so much happen in that city, and we've also seen so much come from that city, including one of our very own founding fathers of the civil rights movement, and that's Martin Luther King Jr. But right now, we want to welcome in someone who has used his platform to talk about voting, to talk about racial injustice, and how he's trying to help. Atlanta's very own Russ joins us now on We the People. Russ, um, I'm not gonna fan out and tell you what are some of my favorite songs were that I listened to repeat on yours. We're gonna get to the topic at hand. So Amazing. we gotta talk about, uh, recently mm -hmm. you did an interview where you shared your outlook on culture and music. And you also were very candid about the fact that um, you have a privilege and that it's necessary for you to give back. Tell everybody about what that means. As like, it's very obvious I'm white and I'm in black culture and I'm benefiting financially off of it. So I feel like if you're a white person financially benefiting off of black culture, you have to put finances back into black culture. It's just that simple. The, the, you know, screenshots with your feelings, it just comes off like fake empathy because it's, it, it comes off very dismissive and very, um, oh, that sucks for y'all. But anyway, back to what I was doing. Have you felt that way always, or is it now because of the time of where we are in this country? I've always had the feeling. I think now uh, it's just obviously elevated. It's a new level and there's new, you know, it's it's to the point now where you can't, first of all, you can't not say anything. Second of all, though, I just think saying something isn't enough anymore. I think, you know, if you have the ability to uh, put money back into a culture that you're financially benefiting from, if you have the ability to, you should. It's interesting that you talk about it in that way because some people do believe that silence is the best way to go because it's hard to talk race, especially if you're white and you're in the black culture. People just feel as if they can't talk about it. They feel awkward. They feel as if they don't have the privilege or the voice or the words. How do you find yourself right now in terms of interacting with people when they want to talk to you about social injustice, police brutality, what's going on in this country right now? Well, first of all, Picking and choosing whether you want to be silent or not about race, that's a privilege in and of itself. But um, no, I mean, you know, I try to just do my best to uh, listen to the the black people around me and the, and the educated black people I have in my life. So I do my best to uh, not act like I have all the answers for for everything, especially in in a culture that I'm not from. But you know, that's why when we when we decided to raise the money. Um, for Black Lives Matter organizations, we, you know, when we raised 500,000, we got on the phone with uh, some of the women who started Black Lives Matter. I got on the phone with Tamika Mallory. I was on the phone with Karen Civil and talking with my friends to make sure the money went to like the correct places, you know, and people who really need it. It's just about listening. That's all. Let's, it's about listening. Let's talk about that for a moment because at the way uh, I think of activism, for me, it, it looks very differently. It's not necessarily just protesting on the front lines. I think that's great. But what about um, being an activist in the way in which you have decided to be one? What inspired you? What did it look like? You said you raised money for Black Lives Matter. What did you do? Mm -hmm. Walk us through everything that you did and how you find yourself in this moment right now. So for me, I, you know, it was three years ago, I had like a string of festivals and I decided that I was going to wear T-shirts with a message on them because I figured what better <laughs> what better time to use a platform than in front of, you know, a bunch of people. Um, so one of the T-shirts I wore was, uh, if you want to change the system, you know, speak up, white silence is pro-racism, the whole thing. Um, and it didn't really like, it's it kind of got swept under the rug back then. Um, but, you know, when all this stuff started happening again and it's, 
been happening, the police brutality against innocent black people. I was like, man, I'm not the biggest artist in the world. And I certainly don't have the most white fans in the world, but I got a good amount of people that I can definitely mobilize and turn into some money. And I know they're down for the cause because it's merch, it's a good thing. And I've always been outspoken anyway, you know? And so it, it, how am I gonna be in black culture and not be outspoken about racism? And then I, I gotta ask you this because you grew up in Atlanta. So that, that gives you a heads mm -hmm. up depending for so many people because you're in the crux of that, of that beautiful black city where there are so many wonderful yeah. black leaders, home of so much great music and things that speak to our culture right now. Um, and we are really, really getting our word out, especially with this platform today, and saying mm -hmm. that we must use our voice to vote. Talk to me about what the importance of voting for you in this upcoming election. Yeah, so I, you know, full transparency, I had never voted before, ever. Um, and because, you know, I was one of those people who was like, my vote doesn't matter. And, you know, and, and, I, and I don't know, maybe it's because I was younger, maybe it's because I really thought that, or I don't know. But I just think that it's, it's got to, you know, now this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a privilege to say it's got to a breaking point for me, because obviously it's been past the breaking point for black people. But I think that as a whole young, you know, the young people need to get out and vote because we're the ones that never show up. <laughs> you know what I mean? We never show up to vote. But, you know, we're the future. So it's like, look, we got to go out there and vote. And then whatever happens, happens. But at least we did our part. You know, you got to do your you know, part. You're very candid in saying that you just decided to vote. And I think there's a beautiful irony in the fact that you have your fans saying, because of you, I'm voting. Uh, right. And there's something beautiful about that. But I want to know why now for you, why in this moment is it important for you to vote? And what hits your spirit to say, yes, this is the time to do it? Honestly, because the, I think that George Floyd really uh, woke up a lot of people who, including myself, who I was, I was vocal and outspoken about racism. I put it in my lyrics. I put it on t-shirts. I would talk about it in interviews. Like, you know, I was vocal about it, but that video in that moment, I think me along with a lot of other people just kind of was like, all right, like words are simply not enough anymore. We gotta do something, whether it's raising money, whether it's voting or all the above, like it's, we gotta do something, you know? And, and, and I'm, um, I'm ashamed that it took that for me to be like, I need to raise money and I need to vote, you know? It's a shame. And I don't know, it just, I guess it snapped a bunch of people out of it, you know? And even if you were vocal and, and whatnot, it's just, it's time to actually put your money where your mouth is. It's time to go vote. You know, it's time to just stop talking about it and be about it, you know? And it's been time for that. But like I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed that it took me this long to actually really, really be about it. But I'm, I'm here now. So Russ, we all know that this is gonna be your first time voting. Tell me what that yeah. experience is gonna be like for you in terms of what you're excited about. I think, you know what it's gonna do for me? It's gonna let me know that I'm, I'm contributing to something bigger than myself and I'm actually putting my money where my mouth is and I'm being about it because, you know, for so long, and I know I'm not alone with this, but, you know, standing on the outside and just screaming about this and that and this should change and this, it's like, all right, but did you vote, <laughs> you know? And so I'm, you know, I know it's it's gonna feel good to know that I I played a, small role you know and that's the problem i think that i think the mentality of like my vote doesn't matter needs to be changed to my vote albeit small does matter it's a role i'm playing and if i play my part and you play your part and he and she plays their part then we make a difference but uh you know it'll feel i i have a feeling it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna feel very very bigger than me and i think when you when you realize that giving uh actually feels better than receiving that's when you start wanting to do your part and contribute so voting is a is an easy way to give you know yeah to whom much is given much is required and you've been given a huge yeah. platform and we are so grateful for you russ philanthropist artist community activist first time voter we appreciate you for yes. doing this okay thank you i appreciate y'all
So cities like Atlanta and Chicago have been at the forefront of the discussions, especially now in this country, when we're talking about COVID-19 and systemic racism, as well as police brutality and what we can do in this country. Uh, again, we're continuing our conversation, letting you know that your voice is your vote and your vote is your voice. We can change where we are in this country. Currently, I'd like to welcome in Chicago Cubs right fielder, Jason Hayward. I appreciate you. I brought in Atlanta and Chicago because I know you grew up in the metropolitan area of Atlanta, more specifically McDonough, let's be technical. Um, and, and you have been very vocal throughout this entire time in terms of what our country's been experiencing. Let's let's look at the past month and a half, if you will. What has been the hardest thing for you to deal with? The hardest thing for me to deal with, Kay, this last month has just been going from the virus shutting everything down to us being called to action. Um, you know, we've had you know, multiple police brutality situations. Uh, we've had people protesting, wanting to get the message out but I really realized that I need to be a part of the positive message and, and make sure that doesn't get lost in all the chaos going on for people to actually hear from a reasonable, respectable person who cares about everyone involved. A reasonable, respectable person who cares about everyone involved, which leads us to more than a vote. Um, it is a beautiful collective of black athletes and, and artists. You are a part of that. Talk to me about why that's important for you right now on this to be a part of that collective. To me personally, it's important to be a part of that because you know, I've you know, somewhat used baseball and my craft as an excuse to not get more involved in voting, but I can't any longer use baseball and, and work as an excuse not to get educated and not also to show people like at any moment in time, any walk of life, we can make a difference. So tell me in your words, what does activism look like for you? In my words, it looks like LeBron James, the biggest athlete right now on the planet, speaking up and breaking the ice for everyone. And I think for the first time people see and hear from us. So now we have white teammates, we have teammates, we have other people speaking up and realizing, okay, like this is how we go about doing this. And to me right now, social media, athletes speaking up, entertainers speaking up, like we're trying to do it more than a vote. You said something I thought was so key because covering sports for so long, I, I know that it's tough for black players specifically in Major League Baseball to talk about how they feel. Um, Adam Jones did it in a very eloquent way early on, but there are very few that are vocal. You said you all were afraid. Why use that word and why were you afraid? You was afraid because in 2019, there were 68 of us total and there are 38 teams. There's 25 man roster on each team. There's a 40 man roster, which, which is on each team as well. And, Oh, there aren't many of us, um, you know, so we're, we're outnumbered in that sense, but not always in a negative way when it comes to our teammates and our clubhouses. But to get to this point, you have to move a certain way. You got to be careful what you say. You can't ruffle feathers. You can't come off in any way, you know, much like other black entertainers, much like, you know, yourself, you know, probably having to live through life every day. But to get to the highest level, you got to button up. You got to be seen and not heard. So baseball, mm. is, like I said, it was, it was time for us to try and speak up and make a difference and and show it's okay to do so because we can't be quiet any longer. That is a button up, be quiet, be seen, but not heard. That is a um, an expression that a lot of black folks can relate to in whatever aspect of, of professionalism that they experience, especially if they don't work for themselves, they just feel that. That is also a socialization that we have as black folks, well, especially like you said, if you wanna to get to the higher level. And for so long, I felt it bubbling right underneath the surface, surface that so many of us who were in whatever positions we were, who had platforms, were tired of pretending and looking the other way and spending so much time making others comfortable while we were uncomfortable. Do you feel that this is the type of movement that is sustainable or is it just for a time? No, it takes everyone joining in on the conversation and, and right now I feel like more than ever, there are there is little things as possible to distract from bigger issues. And we saw on draft day, we saw our president Theo Epstein holding up the sign saying "Black Lives Matter" and and, and wanting yeah, to include the rest yeah. of them be in that. But now we're having those conversations as well. So I definitely think this is sustainable, and and it's not always just going to be the popular thing to do. You know, this is something that people want to get right because they know we care.
Jason, you said you think it's sustainable that what you're seeing, especially with your colleagues in baseball, that this can be something where you're feeling more comfortable, feeling more safe to share how you feel about social injustice and uh, police brutality. What are you doing right now in this moment with your platform to help change how we look at voting and how to educate the culture and the community about voting? Well, first, what I'm doing, Carrie, is joining up with More Than a Vote and joining up with other athletes and entertainers to get that message out and use our platform in that sense as a group um, and, and try to create a brand with this to make it something that's not just about the election coming, make sure that it's about people getting educated for years to come and, and figure out where to vote and how to vote. Um, we've got people in different areas that cover different demographics and, and influence different you know, areas of people. And as a baseball player, as a black baseball player, I feel like now, like we talked about, it's, it's finding the time to show people that you can use your voice in this profession. You don't have to be afraid. And, and to me, that can help someone help a kid growing up. He can see me. He can see other guys that, that were in the video we posted saying, hey, this is what they're standing for. They're speaking up for these things. And it's OK to want to play baseball. It's not lame. It's not something I have to be as afraid of as I was before. So I feel like that's my role in this. Um, I have a younger brother as well. He's 24. He also plays baseball. So I've got to lead by example. I can't just always you know, come up with a good answer that sounds good on TV when I get asked mm -hmm. a question on, you know, what do we need to do to make changes? So I'm joining up here to make sure that I take action and, and get educated myself. For one, so many people, I feel like in Atlanta, they're on the move. But well, when you want to try to make a vote and try and cash your vote, you have to do it by mail. You have to sign up for the absentee ballot. Then you have to get another ballot in return. They have to send it back to you. Well, for me personally, they didn't send that back until it was too late, right? We didn't get it in the mail to the address that's an Atlanta address at my parents' house. We didn't get that in the mail until it was too late. Um, and then from other friends and, and family that are still in Georgia right now, I just hear about them being held in lines too long and, and trying to get off work. And, and we know how it is for, for any family, but let alone you know, a black family in the inner city or in the suburbs <laughs> trying to take care of their family and trying to provide for them. You try to get off work. That, and then, then you're like, wait a minute, you start looking at the clock. It's like, oh, th this is not going to happen today, right? And, and so I saw, um, you know, Mayor Keisha Bottoms, you know, reach out via social media to people and say, hey, you know, I'm going to address these issues right now. I need y'all to stay in line to cast your votes. Keep hanging in there. So to me in Georgia, that's, that's what that looks like. Well, it's interesting that you even bring that up because there have been all these images specifically from Georgia, because that's such a battleground, um, where you see people, especially when it came to the primaries, doing whatever it takes. Um, and this is real life voter suppression that you're talking about. It's been happening for decades. It's not fake. What you're saying, these examples of sending you your ballot too late after the fact or shutting down the polls at six o'clock while people still are in line, that's a real life issue. There needs to be some type of change. And I think that what we're doing right now is fair but the the idea of voter suppression do you think that that is well known especially with folks you know within the generation your generation i think it's known in our communities right i don't think it's spoke on enough i don't think there's been enough light drawn to it bring it to light let people hear about it let people learn about what that looks like and and get more people to say, okay, look, like this is gonna happen. We have to expect this and we can no longer make the excuse. You know, we can't say they didn't want us. Jason, everybody knows, or it feels as if everyone knows that the time is now, America's paying attention to us. We have their eyes, we have their ears. If you look toward the future, what are you most excited about in terms of seeing a change? I'm excited about how fast the word is traveling. You know, that the word is being spread right now. Um, the biggest athletes, the biggest icons, biggest entertainers, are doing their part, but I'm also seeing people out there on the streets doing their part. You know, when so many things got lost, could have very easily got in the, you know, in the commotion when it came to protests and you saw rioting, you saw looting, people still stood their ground and, and people still went out there and said, look, we're doing this for the right reasons. We're going to come together. We're going to use drones. We're going to use social medias. I feel like this is a new wave of getting things done the right way and just spreading the message. You're right about that. And you're right. People are spreading the word unapologetically. We out here. We doubling down. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Right. Yeah. La -la. Hey, everybody. I am so excited to welcome a friend, a brother, uh, family member, if you will, former colleague, 
NBA great, sports analyst, philanthropist. He does it all, and he's here to give us his time and his platform to talk about something that is so important, that is voting. Everybody, welcome Jalen Rose to We The People. Talk to me about how important it is for the people who know you and love you and look up to you. Why is it so important that you use your platform to talk about voting? Initially, we have to get past the stigma of the mental systemic racism that comes with the presidential race, governors, mayors, senators, judges. We've been conditioned to believe that our vote does not matter. So usually when we looked up at all of those races and people that were running, not only did they not look like us, we didn't believe they were there to represent our best interests. So therefore, as a collective, we didn't mobilize until Barack Obama, and we felt a sense of hope that finally our country is going to do something that we felt would never happen in our lifetime. And I remember being at the inauguration in 2008. I made sure I was there. And we voted in 2016. We didn't vote, Carrie. We didn't vote. And mm -hmm. so many people try to make this political. This is not political. Me telling somebody to vote is like telling somebody to pay taxes. So that's one, getting over the stigma of nobody is going to represent our best interest. And then number two, the reality is that the person that gets the most votes doesn't necessarily win the presidency. That's uncomfortable right there because that's actually what took place in 2016. The Electoral College chose the president. And if you put all of their pictures up, I'm pretty sure they look a lot more like each other than they look like you and I. How about mm -hmm. that? And then the third thing, especially in urban environments, Oh man, they create barriers for us, Carrie. It's like, you gotta jump over the fence. You gotta run past the dog. You gotta jump on the hood of the car. The lines is five hours long. You get up to the, to the pole. And the elderly people working 